I'm just going to talk about the future of education, so just a small topic. Last time I was here at the Independent Schools Show, I was speaking about early man. I started off going back by two million years, uh, but this time I'm not going to go quite so far back, and instead I'm going to go back to 1980 as I begin my talk. 1980, the SAS storm the Iranian embassy, West Ham win the FA Cup, everyone is wondering who shot JR, the Rubik's Cube has just appeared in the shops. A few people nodding along, I think you remember those days. And I arrive at my philosophy lesson, Monday, period one, and present as always is my teacher, the school chaplain. But this time, he's accompanied by someone from the maths department. Let's call him Mr. Brown, because this is being filmed, and I think uh, Mr. Brown is still with us. So in the days when cross-curricular work was pretty much unheard of, the sight of a maths teacher in a philosophy classroom was pretty amazing. We knew something was up. There was a frisson of excitement. What possible connection could there be between philosophy and maths? The sense of anticipation was palpable as one by one we began to notice this large object in the corner of the room, a stationary object covered by a blanket we were not going to be disappointed. Mr. Brown said to us that today we were going to see something amazing, something incredible, something that was going to simply blow our mind. Because today, he said, we were going to be seeing nothing less than the future. Well, Mr. Brown walked to the corner of the room and with a single confident flourish, he whipped the blanket away. Well, I don't mind telling you that the young Julian Thomas was slightly underwhelmed having a glimpse into his future because there was a very bulky object with four flashing lights, a large valve, cardboard cards hanging out of one of the sides and what appeared to be a tiny green television screen at the top. This, he told us, was a computer and it was going to change all of our lives. And my, my curiosity was piqued at that. And he then spoke with extreme confidence about what would happen next. You see, he had read a government report written by the experts. Now, I'm sounding a bit like Michael Gove here, but please forgive me on that. But he told us that computers would be able to do things at least, remember this statement, he said, computers would be able to do things at least four times as fast as humans. <laughs> so all the work would be done in a quarter of the time. This was amazing. And what would that mean? Well, that would mean more leisure time for us all. That was, that was the confident prediction. The working week would reduce, first of all, from four day to four days and then to three days. And all of this was going to happen pretty quickly. By the time I even started my working life, I was absolutely delighted. I was sitting up in my chair, three working days, not five. That meant more playing on my skateboard, more cricket, more time on the Rubik's Cube. This was absolutely amazing. More leisure time. What a thought. Amazing. Now, parents in this room, I wonder if you now find yourselves luxuriating in all of that extra leisure time you've been given. How many of us, in fact, check our emails as we wake up? I certainly do. As we walk to work, as we go to bed, how many, how many of us are living that more leisure time dream? So this came to mind one Saturday night when a parent emailed me at 9 p.m., demanding to know why I hadn't responded to their email uh, that they had sent at 7 p.m. on that day. Does that sound like any of you? <laughs> the truth is, and we've seen this time and time and time again, but never ever seem to learn that no one, no one, no matter what their background and expertise, can predict the future, at least not very far into the future. We can only know that we don't know. And that's quite important. What we can say is that change happens. It's always happened. And we can and we must attempt to understand what will guide and shape the change. So we don't know what the future will look like, but we know the drivers. We know the things that are starting to shape it. And perhaps, for me, principal among these shaping forces will be the exponential improvements in new technologies. So as educators, it's self-evident um, that our role is to prepare our students for their future and not our past. And so often we get that confused. And that is why education is so slow 
to react to changing times. Wellington College was founded in 1859. It was the same uh, year that Darwin produced On the Origin of the Species. I think it's a nice coincidence because it brings to mind this idea of evolution. And uh, schools have found it difficult to evolve in that time, but imagine being Charles Darwin. Imagine being in, uh, putting him in a time machine from 1859 and bringing him here to 2018. My guess he'd be pretty discombobulated about everything that he saw around him. But if you put him in an exam room in the summer, he would be very, very at home because it would be absolutely what he was seeing from those days in the mid-19th century. The reason we're so slow to react is because we're driven by an exam, exam system that is stuck in those 19th century origins. So the best schools need to evolve. As, our, as educators, our eyes have got to be fixed firmly on the future. The curriculum must evolve and the way in which we teach must evolve so that our students keep up with this pace of change. I will tell you that many of our schools are finding it desperately difficult to move away from this teach to the test mentality driven by league tables and here's something controversial driven by you because while you place your emphasis on those league tables schools will too. So what's the quickest, easiest, and most definite way to make sure that you hold your league table place? Well, it's by not doing anything different to what you've done before to get to that position. I would argue that we need to be careful. I would argue, having spoken to countless CEOs, and I ask them what attributes they're looking for in the people they employ. So these are the people who make the judgments, the people who employ others, the people whose job it is to make their businesses run well. And they say that, okay, exam results might get you to the door, but it won't get you through it. It's creative thinking, it's teamwork, it's empathy that gets you through the door and make you more likely to succeed. They're the people that CEOs want to hang on to. And now companies are devoting a huge amount of time to identifying it in their recruitment processes. So I wonder how many of you realize just how different it is now to be recruited and how much they are looking for other things way, way, way beyond exam results. So it follows that we should be doing everything we can in schools to engender those characteristics in our students. Educational space has to be created to develop the characteristics and it's why the best schools have already changed their curricula to support this new paradigm. So actually, entrepreneurial skills and skills of enterprise are, are going to be at the heart of education in the future. So joining the dots, recognizing that the geography of a country is interlinked with its history, its economy, its politics, its literature, its art, they are all interlinked. But how often do we see that actually happening in schools? But nothing really happens in isolation. And that's why I believe that independent learning should be at the heart of everything we do. So independent learning, taking an idea, running with it, knowing how to run it, run with it, developing your own thoughts, your own understanding, your own ability to separate the white noise of fake news and, and all the different opinions that are coming back at you and really work out what it is that you think. So independent learning is about having the ability to find new avenues without specific guidance from a teacher. It's recognizing that new ideas flow from a deep understanding of the world around you and not just the world dictated by the exam spec. So schools that stick rigidly to those exam specs in those rigid silos will ultimately fail their students. Maybe not in the exam room, but certainly sometime in their future. So what I'm saying to you this morning is as you look at schools, as you go out around this room and start to talk to the representatives, Ask questions. Make sure you're satisfied with the answers. Ask them about their approach to research. They won't thank me for this. Ask them about their approach to research. Ask them about their approach to developing those independent learners. Ask the leaders about their views on the future and what, if any, changes they've made to their teaching and their curricula to respond to these changing times. If they can't tell you of any changes they've made, despite the fact that you know that the world has changed so much, then surely there's got to be a question mark in your mind. 
Are they sticking with the old methodology, the tried and trusted, or is there evidence that they're moving with the times? Ask them how they integrate the curricula, how we create that joining of the dots. Ask whether their departments, their art department, has ever related the artists they speak about with the history and politics and the economy of the times. Ask them how many GCSEs their students take. I would say, if their answer is 13 or 14, ask the question, why? What is it about taking that many GCSEs that is so important? I believe that pushes out all of the opportunity for really deep and creative uh, knowledge and understanding. So in short, we must remind ourselves that computers are really good at certain things. Recall, logic, analysis, they're the things at the heart of our exam system in 2018. But you don't compete with computers by becoming more like a computer. You compete with computers by becoming more human. You do the reverse. You enhance the human characteristics of creativity, of emotional intelligence, of collaboration and innovation. And that's what we need to be looking for in our schools. And that's what I passionately believe is the future of education in, here in the UK.